everyone, and welcome to The Big Questions, a conversation about current events in liberal arts sponsored by Pearson's Revel Learning Platform. My name is Nilu Tabrizi, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's conversation. Today, we're discussing the election of President Donald J. Trump with historian Bill Brands, political scientist Will Howell, and sociologist Jeff Manza. Our goal is to open a discussion about some of the big questions raised by President Trump's election, big questions that gain insight from the perspectives of history, political science, and sociology. There are a lot of ways to parse the results of the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton won the women's vote by 12 percent, while Donald Trump won among male voters by the same margin. Trump received 58 percent of the white vote, but Clinton received 88 percent of the black vote and 65 percent of the Hispanic and Asian votes. Trump performed better among those without a college degree and with those who live in suburban or rural settings. Clinton performed better in urban settings and among single, highly educated voters. Understanding what it all means is a challenge. So our question is a very basic one. Who elected Donald Trump? Will, would you like to get us started on this one? Sure. Um, in the lead up to your question is much of the answer. We see Clinton getting uh, a disproportionate share of her votes from highly educated people who received more formal education um, uh, from women, from uh, residents of urban settings. Um, to my mind, the, if, you, if, you, if you knew one thing about a voter walking in on election day, if you knew their partisan identification, that was far and away the best predictor, though. And that's been true for a very long time. There's a, a lot of political science research that suggests that if I know whether or not you're a Democrat or a Republican, I've got a lot of um, leverage on which to predict a lot of your behavior. And so we see 90% of Republicans on Election Day voting for Donald Trump and 89% of uh, Democrats voting for Hillary Clinton. And this at the back end of an incredibly tumultuous season. Um, uh, set of in the primaries and the general election, there was all kinds of strife within and across the parties. But if all you saw were, were the results on election day and how people voted, it would look much like past elections. So, Will, does this mean that it's a matter of turnout to determine who wins? If Republicans always vote for Republicans, I mean, by 90 percent, you say, and Democrats for Democrats, then we get a Democrat or a Republican as a victor, depending on which side turns out it's voters more? Absolutely. Turnout is, particularly when we, as a nation, are on a knife edge, right? This was, yeah. uh, Donald Trump won, but he barely won, and he didn't win the popular vote. Right. Um, and so it's about your ability to turn out key demographics. And so much of what campaigns are about are trying to stimulate people to get involved. So there's a couple of puzzles about this election for me. One is Hillary Clinton had far more money than Donald Trump to or and had a much bigger organizational field operation which should have been able to turn out her voters. And why didn't that happen? Why we do see a turnout bias in Trump's favor. And I think that was key to how he managed, particularly in those critical Midwestern states, to prevail. And, it, and I think it's an interesting puzzle. Why didn't her organizational advantages pay off the way we might have expected? It's a big open question. There are all kinds of things, in addition to the advantage she had, particularly over the summer, less so at the right before the election, but over the summer she had a big advantage on, on the ground game. She had much more money. Um, she spent uh, considerably more on advertising than he did, um, and yet that didn't translate into a win. These similar kinds of um, upsets and unorthodox unorthodoxies played out in the, in the primaries as well. Yeah, I think that's my other kind of big puzzle is how, how did Trump manage to win in the primaries? Again, without endorsements from, from leading Republicans, without uh, significant, he didn't spend very, I mean, he, he, bragged about, he bragged about how rich he was and he could sell fun, but he didn't actually spend very much on his campaign. Recurrently in American history, there are candidates who have charisma. And charisma is usually identified as some appealing trait that draws people in. Donald Trump had, maybe you could call it charisma for the 21st century or charisma for the Twitter age, in that he became the story. You know, your question was, how did he get so far without raising a lot of money? He was the story. He got, he got more publicity than any candidate before simply because of what he would say. The cameras had to be on him because you never knew what he would say. And he, he understood. And, you know, in this respect, he's a little bit like Ronald Reagan. I mean, Ronald Reagan was the candidate who was trained in Hollywood. So he knew how to deal with cameras. And Donald Trump was trained on reality television. And he, he transformed this whole campaign into a reality TV show. And whether you were really liked it or really hated it, you couldn't turn away. That's right. It's, it's not just, he didn't know just what to do, 
how to behave when the cameras are on him. He knew how to, how to get the cameras to be trained on him. He, it, it, overwhelmingly disproportionate share of free media attention was directed in, uh, towards him. And the whole business of saying, I will make an important announcement three days from now. Instead of, you know, here's the important announcement. You know, okay, you have to keep following for the next three days. Yeah. I mean, I think his use of social media is a big part of the story, too. That his ability to, ma to master that medium in a way that no other candidate had really done, I think, and, and to build a, a mammoth Twitter following that would be activated whenever something happened in the campaign. That then would spill over into news stories and, right. and television coverage. Right. It wasn't just these one-off tweets that then people would like or not like and, and right. retweet or not, but that it set in motion uh, the whole dialogue that followed. So, he, so that he was able to set the terms of much of the discussion in a very crowded field of Republican contenders. So yeah. 17 or so. Right. Well, Bill, one question I would ask you from a historian's perspective is, um, we've never seen a non-politician win the White House. And in fact, we've virtually never seen, with maybe the exception of Wendell Wilkie in 1940, we've, we've virtually never had a, even a serious contender who had not ever been elected to political office. How do you think Trump's outsider status fit into the larger pattern of American political history? And, and is it, was it an advantage, disadvantage, or, or kind of neutral for him? One of the things it demonstrated is that things have changed because, as you correctly point out, in nearly every other case, candidates had to be vetted at a lower level. Now, typically, this meant that you had to start out in local politics and state politics. And people would see your party would insist on knowing that you could win elections, that there weren't some real nasty skeletons in your closet. And so they basically would try you out in the farm league, so to speak. But what Trump demonstrated, what he realized is first, and it, this had a lot to do with the way the Republican primary system was set up, where you could sort of parachute and you didn't have to be a, a well-vetted Republican. You could just announce, I'm going to run for the Republican nomination. And in a lot of states, people who are not registered Republicans could vote. And so he could bring all this stuff in. But he's, he did what, he did in his own way what Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan did. They found ways of circumventing the establishment. And Roosevelt reached out to the American people via his radio fireside chats. And Reagan went over the head of his opposition in Congress via television. And Trump found that he could do this on Twitter. And then once you've done that, then you force the rest of the media to respond to what you've done. But he set the terms of the debate in a way that previous candidates have not been able to. It's interesting there have been a number of outsiders in recent decades who've sought the presidency and even in some cases won a primary or two, uh, you know, state primary. Um, but typically, they, once they get vetted, they, they, you know, their warts begin to show and, and uh, their popularity kind of, boom, you know, has a brief boom and then decline. And that never happened to Trump. And it's like his warts began to be visible to voters and, and yet he didn't suffer the same penalty. Right. He, he didn't get any endorsements, neither with very few within the party and almost none in, in, in the popular media. And that ends up, if anything, plays to his advantage. Out, he, it, it brandishes his outsider status. It gives him a sense that I'm, I'm the populist candidate. I'm the one who stands with the people. And that becomes the focus of the conversation such that really well qualified standard Republican candidates just flop very early on in the, in the primaries. What typically has happened to the, the outsiders, the insurgents in the past is they win a few primaries, they start developing some momentum, and then they start acting presidential. And it basically loses that, the, the insurgents that have been following them. What Trump understood was you just keep going right down this path and you don't even have to act presidential when you get into the general campaign, once you've got the nomination locked up, because that's when everybody has pivoted to the center. What Trump realized is there is no center anymore. And so you keep playing to your base. And you hope you turn out the base, to get back what, what Will was saying. And if they show up in the crucial states, you can win. You can carry it all the way to the White House. And the thing that we're dealing with now is, does he be, start acting presidential when he's actually president? And so far, it's looking as though he's going to do what carried him to the White House in, while he's in the White House. Now, let's see if we have a follow-up question from our audiences. Good morning. Uh, my question is, uh, you all brought out at least the percentages as it relates to Democrats and Republicans. But what about the independent and affiliated voters? Because obviously they are a large share of voters, and we can't ignore that, and certainly in terms of turnout and what's supported for Donald Trump. Want to try that, Will? Are there really independents out there? 
Well, the percentage of people, when you ask them uh, which party do you affiliate with, um, the percentage who come out and say that they're independent has actually grown rather markedly in the last 30, 40 years. Um, that said, it is also a highly polarized uh, political environment, both certainly at the elite level, but also among the mass electorate. And, <clears throat> um, and so much of the play is how do you get not, there are two things in play in campaigns, right? One is, can you get that marginal voter who's going to be an independent to turn your way? And then can you get your base to come out? And that's the, that's the playoff. I, to my mind, right now, most of the attention is being paid on turnout and less on persuasion and changing minds and, and convincing that you, dear independents, who are undecided, ought to come my way. It's really about... So I would slightly dissent from the view that, that the independents are true independents, that most independents, when pressed, when asked, do you lean Democrat or Republican, they will actually pick a side. There are very few people who truly in this contemporary political environment of high degree of polarization are true independents and could go either way, um, that, that has, I think, actually diminished. So and on the one do, hand, And do they vote their leaning then? then they, yes. And they look just like the people who say they're Democrats or Republicans. And, and, and so on the one hand, the, the interesting thing is, I think the, the percentage of people who want to think of themselves as independent has grown, while the percentage of independents who actually lean one way or the other has, has increased as well. So those independents actually are, could be treated just like Democrats and Republicans. Do we, do we know, for example, how many, if any, um, of people who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 voted for Donald Trump in 2016? Do we have statistics tiny, on that kind of thing? It's a tiny percentage. Yeah. It's in this way that there are, are lots of continuities. Again, if you're a Democrat, you're going to vote Hillary Clinton despite her high negatives. And her, her negatives were well north of 50 percent. And if you're a Republican, you voted for, for Donald Trump, even though his negatives were even higher. Yeah. So all of the ways in which both parties were unsettled and, and not thrilled with their candidates, that's true. But come election day, the votes that were cast were consistent with their party affiliations. There's another interesting thing that, uh, that you political scientists like to talk about, which is the role of, of economic conditions going into an election and how that affects the incumbent party. And so there are about nine or ten different um, models trying to predict the, the presidential election based primarily on how the, the economy is doing and whether the incumbent party will be punished or rewarded for that performance. And so the economy has been kind of at a, at a kind of slow growth phase uh, uh, and you know that typically means the incumbent party is, is, is likely to be punished a bit and, and many of these forecasting models had a very, very close election so that people were predicting back in the, in the summer that it was going to be a, and it turned out to be a very close election, you know, more or less in line with those, with those predictions. That's exactly right. Okay, so to wrap up this question, I'd like to get a brief takeaway from each of our authors. So Bill, why don't you just start us off? What was your big takeaway? Well, this is the historian's typical dodge. We don't know what this election means until we see what happens. If Donald Trump's presidency is successful, then there will be emulators. There will be other people who say this is how we need to do it the next time around. If the presidency is unsuccessful, then this will be this one-time curiosity. And if I'm writing history textbooks 30 years from now, I'll say I probably won't spend a whole lot of time on this particular campaign. I think what I'm most struck by as a political scientist is that amidst all the tumult of the campaign and all of the disruption within the parties and across the parties, and all the strife that we're observing across the nation. Um, we see, come election day, people um, marching in formation. That, that, and, if, and you wouldn't, if all you saw were the returns on voting day, you, you'd think it was like any other election. And that's not what we've, we've observed at all. I guess for me, the, the, uh, there's kind of two questions about the Trump election that, that I'm, I'm thinking hard about. And so one of them is, is this the beginning of a new kind of, of, of political campaign that signals a big departure from the way presidents and presidential uh, contenders have, have sought office in the past? And the other is, does this signal a, a renewed tension among different racial, ethnic, and, and even gender groups, as, uh, as we pointed out at the beginning of this segment? And is conflict likely to increase in the near future over uh, Trump and Trump's election, or is this merely uh, a kind of a one-off event that is unlikely to have a big impact in the future. Well, that concludes our discussion of who elected Donald Trump. 
Thank you for taking the time to watch The Big Questions. Thank you.